guys and gals, long time no see. It's me, your old pal, old friend, and old buddy, Legio. And hopefully you haven't forgotten about me in my absence, because it has been a while since I posted. And there's a good reason for that, I promise. But first, let's get the episode introductions done and out of the way. So today, we are back in Thunder Bay, which is My City Skylines 1, reimagination of the Tampa Bay region, where I pull multiple influences from all around the world, primarily Florida, and force them all into this fictional region of mine in a game that's now nearly a decade old. And when I say that out loud, I kind of sound like a weirdo, but I guess it's no weirder than any of the other uh, hobbies and other YouTubers doing stuff on here. You know, it's just hard to believe that I've been grinding away at this game for nearly a decade now, and I do literally mean grinding away. And uh, as for the grind today, it brings me to a project I have been dreading of starting until I actually got into it. Uh, I thought this build was going to be a real slog through the proverbial mud, but once I got into it, it kind of sucked me in, and I actually am very, very happy with the results. I think you guys are going to be happy with the results as well. And with that said, uh, I did end up cutting a lot of the fat off of this episode. I tried to keep the lean meat of the episode on the screen, and you know, the stuff you guys would actually want to see and not me spending an untold amount of time inching nodes and segments into place and aligning props and decals. But with all that said, we're going to get to talking about what's on the screen, but one last uh, note to make. You're probably going to hear a lot of noise in the background. Uh, I moved my computer downstairs into the basement, and I'm literally just feet away from my furnace and AC unit. And it makes a lot of noise. Uh, I'm going to try to use a noise reduction to to kind of get a lot of that out so you don't have to suffer through that. I'm suffering through it. You're also going to hear my dog going crazy because she's upstairs running back and forth chasing the cats. So I apologize for any of the noise, but I, it is what it is. You guys have come to expect this. If you're new to the channel, this is nothing new. If you are a longtime fan, you know what I'm about by now. But anyways, let's start talking about what we have going on screen here. So the first thing I did here was carve out a couple canals and I opted to hand make these canals instead of using the in-game ones because I wasn't a really big fan of the in-game canals. I don't like I'm not a fan of much of the in-game stuff but what are you going to do? Uh, the in-game canals just didn't have the detail or the dimensions I was looking for in this build. So hand drawn it is I guess. I also knew that I was going to want these uh, canals to set much lower than the street level. And I also wanted to add some details that you're going to see later on. And doing it this way actually made it easier. A little bit more tedious, but wasn't actually that difficult once I got things coming together. Like a puzzle. I started piecing everything together. And once I got the canals in place, I used the uh, Big Piers Network by Hockenheim to get a walkway in place. It's not like it's really used. I've only seen one or two citizens taking it, but I think it looks nice, so we're keeping it. And... Uh, my main inspirations for this area were the Tampa River Walk and uh, also a major influence from the San Antonio River Walk. And uh, if you haven't been to those places, I highly suggest you go. They're pretty cool in their own ways. I'd say in this build, I probably lean more towards the San Antonio River Walk, with the exception that my river, or canal, whatever you want to call it, is uh, much wider. Uh, the width of my of my uh, body of water here ended up being pretty much a whole city block, which I think was about 10 to 12 units, we'll say 12 units. So that's about 96 meters, give or take. And the river walk in San Antonio, it's about 200 feet in American and 600 meters in the rest of the world. So mine's a bit wider, but that's perfectly fine. In my make-believe history, this area wasn't a fully intact peninsula anyways, even though in reality it is. Instead, uh, I'm going to make believe this area had some small islands that they just connect with some bridges and they use these canals in the place. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to suspend our disbelief here and go with it because I do like the way this ends up turning out. But after I get the pathways all figured out, uh, I use the intersection marking tool to make those stone walls and then align them with some network grass above to create a multi-level appearance. And then I top everything off with some trees up above just to blend everything in. Gives it a more natural appearance. 
And uh, overall, I'd say this turns out pretty good. Uh, using the network multi-tool saved me a lot of time and also saved me a lot of nodes. Because uh, if you do detailed builds, you'll notice that you can hit your node limit pretty quick. The one problem I'm going to be facing is uh, the procedural objects are going to start really bogging down this build. So I'm going to have to figure out some cheats to this. But yeah, anyways, really like how these canals turned out. I'm just kind of detailing these stairs up to give people access to it. Um, I didn't have the forethought of giving it <laughs> handicap accessibility. I uh, just completely forgot to do that. So shame on me. I would make a terrible city planner. I completely failed our Americans with disabilities. But I guess in the city lore, I'm going to say the city failed when they were... Uh, when they were reconstructing this or building this, we'll just say they completely forgot to put all that in there. We're not going to blame me. We're going to blame past city managers. Because uh, the only access for the handicapable is that ramp at the very, very end. Otherwise, you're going to have to, I don't know, Tony Hawk it down some stairs, I guess. Best of luck to you getting down there. Anyways, yeah, I think this area turned out really good. Uh, if I had to do it over, though, I would make this come out. Come out. I'd make this canal a little smaller and give it a more intimate feel because I'll admit it's pretty wide and pretty open. But I was way too far along in the build once I noticed how wide it was to want to go back and change it. And what I'm telling myself is they left it this open for boats, kayaks, jet skis, and any other watercraft somebody might use to navigate through this easily. And then I just kind of finished touching this area up by using some intercession marking tool to create a nice little grass median right down the middle of everything. And then I cover that up with some, I think those are the street trees, the young street trees. They look really nice. And I line that up the whole way down. I didn't show you the whole process because it was really tedious and that was part of the fat that I was talking about that I cut out in this episode. Because it was probably about just 40 seconds of me doing intercession marking. That's boring to watch. Uh, but what it does is it divides this walkway into two sections. You have the waterfront side, which is what I want to be the main draw of the area, the main focal point, which is, you know, literally the waterfront itself, the railing and all that. And then the secondary purpose for this commercial area, which is really just procedural objects uh, that I'm pretending to be restaurants and shops over here. And I put these strategically along the walkway. They're not completely lined because that would be a bit much to do. And they'd probably be overbearing in real life anyways. You probably want you probably want some separation between all these different shops I'm putting in here. But yeah, I thought these would be a nice touch in here to give you a place to have lunch or go shopping. If you're on a walk or something, be a nice little tourist trap in the area. And uh, I kind of themed different spots, like the last spot you saw. They were Spanish style buildings I used. Uh, it's the first Spanish style stuff I've used in this build, but there is definitely more to come, I promise. And then uh, I was really happy with this corner. Uh, I found that building, I forget the name of the building, but it's a commercial building that has a nice little round corner look to it. And I was able to just kind of fit that into that corner because I wasn't really sure what I was going to do with that area right there. But I knew I wanted something in there. And I found the perfect pieces to go in there. That's probably more of your typical uh, run-of-the-mill touristy trap area. It's not got any real theme to it. It's probably just a bunch of souvenir shops and overpriced restaurants. But we touched the area up with some more Spanish-style builds right here. Uh, I really like the roofs on these things, the tile look. When I think of Spanish-style buildings, those are that's kind of the, the roofing I think of. So... Put a, quite a bit of these in here, line up this section of the river walk with it. And I think this whole area comes together, really pops, it stands out. Uh, I just kind of, I had to fiddle with it a little bit to get it looking exactly how I want. And then I cross over the river here. Uh, I only bothered putting the path on that one side. Uh, I thought some asymmetry would be nice here. Uh, I tend to be too symmetrical with my builds. So a little bit of asymmetry is fine. Uh, but if we're being honest, I was also just too lazy to make another path. It, that was really tedious work, and I didn't want to do it again. So, sorry. Making the first one was enough. You'll just have to forgive me. And then here, I spend quite a bit of time uh, working those keys. You didn't see it on screen, but what I did is I took that the railed key, that's what I'm calling it, the 
key with that fence up there and then I added a key without the railing and put that underneath the road uh, which was silly in the long run because then I lined everything with the stone wall so it was almost kind of frivolous work that I did but it still all turned out really nice and I opted to leave the to leave this area what I'm calling in a natural more natural state no shops no walkway Part, partly of me being lazy, like I said, but also partly because I think it's really cool and unique. Uh, if you are on a kayak or a boat or something coming through this area, it, it'd be nice to see that instead of just a bunch of business and storefronts. So, you know, I like the way it turned out. I had to use a lot of terraforming networks to get everything to work fine because, you know, how uh, you know, a terrain is in this game. It's never happy. It's always upset with you. But I really like the way everything turned out. It just took me a long time to line everything up. So if the camera's jumping around a lot, it's because I I cut out a lot of fluff here. Because lining everything up, how many times can I say that? Take a shot every time I say line up. But connecting all the nodes and creating all the segments and making it look nice and pretty took a long time and a lot of work. And I did not want to bore you. And I didn't want to give you a seizure with all the uh, jagged cuts I had to do in my editing process. So please forgive me for the low quality of uh, editing here and the low quality of uh, voiceover. Because uh, I didn't write notes for this section, I just kind of winged it. And speaking of winging it, I now begin work on what I'm terming the Resort Peninsula. And you're going to see why here in a little bit, and it's pretty obvious. And uh, out here we're obviously going to have a few resort style hotels and we're also going to try to get in a marina. And uh, I really think this area turns out pretty good, turns out well. Uh, I know I say that a lot, but I tried my hand at something I've never used before in this game. Always wanted to, but I never tried it. And I think the results are really nice. Uh, you'll see that coming up in a second. But I do think this is some of my best work I've ever done in City Skylines, especially when the detail work comes in. And I'm pretty sure you guys are going to like it too, so uh, please leave comments and feedback down below. Uh, I, I like getting my stuff rated by you people. It validates me. But I went into this project without really a detailed plan at all of what I was going to build. The only thing I had was the main theme of what I wanted, which was a marina with some resorts nearby. That was really the only idea I had for this area. So I just sat down and set out to build and I uh, wanted to see what would happen. And what happened was one of the greatest frustrations I've ever had with this game ever to date. Uh, water once again came to ruin my day as I could not get its cooperation at all. Uh, a lot of uh, it took place off screen. So what you're seeing right now is the, uh, the nice, the water acting and behaving nicely towards me. The rest of it was me dealing with water flooding everything. But I do eventually get things sorted out mostly with some off-screen magic and a little bit of selling my soul. So I didn't need that part of it anyways. In here I'm just detailing around the marina, trying to make the area look nice and welcoming, mostly to somebody who could afford a boat, because I myself could not afford a boat. I'm a, I'm a peasant in this world, so I'm not even sure what a good marina should look like. But I'm pretty sure you wouldn't have it typically sticking out on the tip of a peninsula right there. That's probably not correct, but it's gonna stay because I like that location. I think it looks pretty cool. And I do plan on adding many more marinas throughout the map as the city expands. So those are probably gonna be way more realistic, but I think this one's all right. And I do put a breakwater feature off screen in the area and just covered it up with rocks to add some more sense of realism. You do see those in these areas just to kind of control the water. And it was an added benefit that didn't end up Kind of helping control the water in this area because I was getting massive waves here and there so it just kind of helps calm everything down and then here I'm just adding some boats into the dock area trying to give it a little bit more sense of realism and I tried to have variety with this but I quickly realized I was severely lacking in boat assets initially and that's that's a massive fail on my part especially when you're building a coastal city I should have had them more but you know it is what it is, uh, so I had to go to the workshop against my better judgment and add a ton more subscriptions and really bloat my asset list. So that sucked, but everything does turn out looking pretty good, so I'm not too I'm not too upset about it. And then for the next minute or so, it's just me working on these boats and parking lot and setting up the keys and some roads for the build later on. 
So it's probably a good time to jump into some comments that I've received recently. And I'm gonna highlight two comments from somebody who I'm terming my number one fan, because they've been with me since day one with this series. And that's gonna be Mr. DJ. And the first comment we have from him is he says, great build, really enjoy the bigger builds in one episode. Well, you're getting a big episode with a lot of build in it, so congrats. And he wants more detailing as opposed to some creators who try to cram 10 builds into a 20 minute video. Yeah, I agree with that. If you're doing too much in a 20 minute video, uh, it, it just feels crazy. Uh, it's hard to follow. So I like my videos typically 20 to 30 minutes with a main focus on one build. That's what I like. And uh, this episode is only large because it's been a while since I posted. I had a lot of, I had a lot of video I could add and I figured you guys have missed me long enough so I might as well put a lot into it. But there is good detail work. The best detail work is coming up a little bit later in the episode, I promise. I think you guys are gonna like how we end it. And then the next comment I have is a little lengthy from him, but we're gonna read it anyways. He says he's excited to see the city get filled in the next few episodes, which is coming, and it is happening, I promise. He still thinks CS1 has more to offer in terms of building realistic, detailed cities rather than CS2, and I 100% agree with that. And he is sure the algorithm is pushing CS2 content out to people right now since the big creators are doing it. Uh, me and him had a conversation about how I'm just not getting a wide reach and my views are down, but I don't really care that much. But we were talking about it anyways. And he said I could run a CS2 series alongside Thunder Bay in alternate episodes. And uh, sir, you read my mind. Uh, that is actually going to happen. So good for you. You're gonna get what you wanted. Uh, yeah, so announcement, I guess, of sorts. Uh, I am gonna start a CS2 series and I am gonna try to alternate between a CS2 build and a Thunder Bay build. So I'm gonna alternate episodes because I'm not done with CS1. I, I just can't give up the realism it offers right now, at least in the terms of visuals. Re realistically, this is not a good city simulator. It's a good city builder, not a good city simulator. But I'm gonna come back to Thunder Bay. I'm not done with it. I'm gonna have a lot more fun with it. But I think City Skylines 2 is finally about to the point where I won't be pulling my hair out trying to do stuff. It looks like the mods that are on Paradox are finally, uh, they're finally coming out and they're finally worth something. Cause I've been watching a few videos. I haven't followed any of them too closely because the algorithm on my YouTube is kind of silly right now. It's suggesting some odd stuff. But I have been following the major ones, mostly Sully, seeing what he's doing. And uh, yeah, I think it's finally at the point I can come back to CS2 and uh, start a new series with that. Uh, if you haven't seen my first series, uh, I tried to reimagine San Francisco. It's very similar to Thunder Bay, uh, but you know, without all the mods and everything, I wouldn't say it was very realistic. Very hard to build, rebuild a city without mods. So hopefully it gets a little easier. I also noticed, and another reason I'm going back to it, the view counts on my channel are down for Thunder Bay but uh, my City Skylines 2 series with San Francisco are going up. It's, it, I thought it was weird, but then when he said that, all the major creators are pushing that content, it makes way more sense. So we'll go back to CS2 for a little bit. Um, I don't see a problem with it. The game seems fun again. So we'll go back, take it a spin, but I'm not done with this series yet by any stretch of the imagination. Um, there's a lot more I wanna build in this. And I can't build it in CS2 yet, so we're gonna have to alternate, which is fine. We'll, we'll see how that series goes, so I'm excited for it. But again, thank you, sir. Uh, I really appreciate your comment. Uh, if you guys want your comments read, you actually have to make a comment. And if you're enjoying this build, if you're enjoying past builds, or if you just wanna see uh, what I build next, either leave me a like, give me a subscribe, but mostly I like the comments. They're the things that I enjoy the most. Well, let's do something you guys seem to enjoy and go ahead and get into today's history lesson for the episode. And today's history lesson will be on the city of Tampa's history itself. So let's just go ahead and get right into it. So by my research, the name Tampa originates from a native Calusa word, possibly the word Entempi, which was mispronounced by the Spanish and then later myself. The meaning is something to the effect of stick a fire or a place to gather sticks or something to do with wood. It's something along those lines. It's still being debated today by scholars and they're just not sure quite yet. 
And if you are familiar with uh, American naming conventions for cities, you'll notice that we use a lot of Native American words, and then we will wildly mispronounce them later on. It's almost a game to us at this point. Anyways, the name Tampa first showed up in 1575 in the memoirs of Hernando de Escalante Fontanada, who was a captive of the local Calusa tribe. He referred to it as tan ha with an N, and that was later changed by the Spanish, probably because Tampa just rolls off the tongue a little easier. Anyways, moving past the entomology of the name, the earliest known people that were documented in the Tampa region were that of the Minnesota people, and this was between 500 BCE and 700 BCE. Now, I couldn't find a whole lot of these people. Uh, their culture was referred to as an archaeological culture, which is kind of a nice way of saying we know they existed and we do have evidence for their existence, but we just don't have a whole lot on them. Like, we don't know a lot about their culture. We don't know much outside of the pottery that was found. And, and you'll typically get the term archaeological culture when we just don't have enough information to distinguish between different tribes. So they kind of get lumped together in that sense. But now we'll fast forward a little bit to the age of exploration. Spanish explorers first arrived in the Tampa Bay area in the early 16th century. In 1528, the Spanish explorer Panfilo de Navarres arrived and he was followed by Hernando de Soto in 1539, both of whom we did talk about in a previous episode. Both expeditions were unsuccessful, however, in establishing permanent settlements, which we have talked about but they did leave significant impacts on the indigenous populations due to disease and conflict. This left the Tampa Bay region sparsely populated for nearly two centuries, and Florida would be exchanged several times between Spain and Britain, but neither empire showed much interest in this area or the Gulf of Mexico really at all, and they left the region mostly alone. As time passed, the region became a safe haven for natives and refugees, as well as escaped slaves from the American South. And then they all coalesced into one group, which would be known as the Seminoles. The Seminoles and the Americans would fight a series of wars in the area. This was called the Seminole Wars, and this lasted from 1816 to 1858, roughly. And now I do plan on covering these wars a little later on, so I'll skip over them for now, but just know the natives inevitably did not win. Go figure. In 1823, the U.S. government strong-armed the Seminoles into signing the Treaty of Moultrie Creek, which created a reservation within Central Florida. In an effort to enforce that treaty, the U.S. built Fort Brook at the mouth of the Hillsborough River. And with bittersweet irony, the fort sat atop the old Tokubaga tribal ceremonial mound. Just really rubbing the salt in the wound on that one. In 1845, Florida became the 27th state of the U.S. After enough people began to move into the Tampa Bay region, it steadily grew. And things took a hard left turn in 1848 when a strong hurricane swept over Tampa and almost took it off the map. This caused major damage and also the potential abandonment of the area. But persistence did pay off and the residents rebuilt, and in 1849, the village of Tampa was made official with 185 residents. In 1861, the state of Florida seceded from the Union and joined the Confederacy. And at this time, the local army outpost of Fort Brook was soon then occupied by Confederate troops due to its strategic positioning. Tampa was then placed under martial law under the Confederacy during the war, and its local government was suspended. During the war, Tampa became blockaded by Union troops under the famous Anaconda Plan, and during this time, Confederate blockade runners would routinely attempt to gather supplies and resources by sneaking past the blockade. This prompted Union forces to bombard Fort Brook and its surrounding area, which had little effect However, it did damage uh, civilian infrastructure and it cost a few lives here and there. But you know, civilian casualties are always acceptable. And this became known as the Battle of Tampa. Later on, Union forces raided up the Hillsborough River and severely damaged Confederate boats that were doing the blockade runs. And this became known as the Battle of Fort Brook. And this would inevitably cripple the blockade runs and really damage supply lines for the Confederacy. In the end, Tampa was taken by Union forces in May of 1864, and it would remain 
and Union forces would remain in the area until August of 1869. Post-war Tampa slowly recovered with the opening of its port again and some reconstruction efforts. Things really picked up for the Tampa region when they finally got a rail line, which was orchestrated by businessman Henry Plant, more on him later, in 1884. And this allowed for many, many commercial avenues to come into the city, including the phosphate industry, cattle, and what we're going to be moving into, the cigar industry. A pivotal moment in Tampa's history came with the arrival of Vincent Martinez Ibor, who is a Spanish immigrant who moved his cigar manufacturing operations from the Key West into Tampa in the 1800s. He established Ibor City, which became a major center for cigar production, and this attracted thousands of immigrants from Cuba, Spain, and Italy. Ibor City grew exponentially and showed great promise. So much so, in fact, that the city of Tampa decided to annex the area in 1887 along with North Tampa, greatly increasing the city of Tampa itself. Jumping forward a few years, the next major point in Tampa's history is the start of the Spanish-American War. In 1898, the outbreak of the Spanish-American War led to Henry Plant convincing the War Department to use Tampa as a staging area for U.S. forces greatly increasing the town's economy. And I don't want to get too into the weeds with the Spanish-American War here, because as with this war, as with any war, there's just so much information on it and it can be very controversial. Also, this war is not one I'm super knowledgeable on at this time, so I'll circle back to it when I've had a chance to read the Wikipedia page and obviously the links that are associated and some other sources. I don't want to talk in a war I don't know much about. It's just not my forte of history. Tampa continued to be vital to the U.S. military going forward. The city eventually became home uh, to MacDill Air Force Base in 1941. And MacDill is a very large base and that is home to major components to the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Navy. I've actually been to this base in my career and I gotta say for a military base it's pretty damn nice. I'll discuss it later on when I build my own base so you know look forward to that. But in conclusion, that's Tampa's history in a nutshell. Uh, most of the modern history is pretty similar to other U.S. cities, in my opinion, with major civil rights movements, urban growth issues, and the suburbanization of the region. I've talked about these topics in other episodes, so I don't really want to repeat myself. But hopefully you guys enjoyed this lesson. If you did, you know what to do down below. Now let's get back to what we're doing on screen. And what we're doing on screen here is essentially the big project for this whole episode, and that is the Luxury Resort. And uh, yeah, love the way this area inevitably does turn out. Uh, you're gonna see a big change here in just a second, uh, cause I wasn't exactly sure how I wanted things to look. Originally, I thought I wanted to have these tennis courts there, and then I was just like, no, nah, that's kind of weird. I'm gonna move those, and I'm gonna put in something that most resorts actually do have and that being a big, massive uh, pool infrastructure. And to do this, I used the, uh, the water parks assets and everything from Sully on the workshop, so I'll put a link to that down below. These assets are absolutely awesome. Like, this is the kind of stuff that I can't wait to see come to fruition in City Skylines too. Um, yeah, the, just look at this. That that looks amazing. And I didn't even do that great a job on it. I've seen much better builds with this, but I mean, for my skill level, I think this looks amazing. Uh, they're a little finicky. Uh, it takes some time getting used to these assets, uh, but the results are just great. Uh, just I love the look of this pool. Uh, the biggest problem I had with using these assets was filling it with water. Um, and there is a uh, fresh water source built into the asset pack, essentially. And uh, what it is, is it's an invisible water tower and uh, invisible water outlet. I don't really know how he did it. I don't really, I don't want to mess up and, or anything like that, but basically it will fill your pool with water. And it's just an awesome, awesome effect. Uh, you can see there, I finally got the water. It took me forever to get it to work. And I thought it was because the asset didn't work, but it turns out it was user error on my part. Because while I was building the pool, I didn't realize it. Somewhere in the walls, I had a leak and the water was spilling out onto the roadway. So I had to go through with terraforming networks a couple times and play around with it. It's pretty finicky because 
water. City Skylines 1, water, they just, it sucks. Uh, but I eventually did get in. You can see there it's now filled with water and it looks awesome. So next what I move on to is kind of going around the pool area and just kind of detailing the area out. And I end up dotting it with some custom made planners that I design. And I make these using the uh, concrete retaining wall network. And then I just lower the nodes down to what would be a fairly reasonable height. I would have, I would assume it's reasonable. They're probably still too high, but they look fine. And uh, then the decals in the area kind of did the rest of the work for me because they laid over the top of the network and they gave it a really good looking texture. So that was just a happy accident. I didn't plan on that happening, but it happened and I just ran with it. It's great when a plan comes together. And then uh, I kind of fill up the planners using some PO gravel surfaces. Uh, it's a pretty common trick I use. Pretty sure it's a common trick everybody has used at some point if you do detail work in City Skyline. So there's nothing special there, but I, I do like the way the, uh, the uh, gravel textures turned out. I played with it a little bit in the theme mixer to get exactly what I wanted. I wanted it to look more like mulch. And then I'm just going to figure out the uh, gravel settings later with something else. I, I like the look of that texture right there. Sorry, my dog's walking upstairs and being extremely loud. I don't know if you could hear that. But anyways, uh, yeah, so I did my own custom designs here. And I really like how some of these turned out. I have that like star shape up there in the top left, if you saw that. Kind of like a shuriken, I guess. Like a ninja star. Uh, that turned out pretty cool. That, 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 was, that was fun to build. I enjoyed that one. And then uh, the rest are kind of just unique shapes. I had that teardrop shape one that was kind of interesting and fun to build as well. I like those unique fun shapes. It just, it feels different. And I feel like in a resort area, you would have very unique shaped planters to add some mystique to the area. I don't know if that's the right word, but it's the word I'm going with. Just add some character to it, make it look different, make it stand out. While at the same time, it's still fairly generic. Uh, because a lot of these bigger companies, they want you to feel like they're unique and exotic, but when you boil them down to their core and you really look at them, they're all the same. I I've been to multiple hotels slash resort style things, and they all try to have their own little unique take on the same damn thing. And they're, they're all essentially the same. And we know it. I mean, everybody knows it, but we all just accept it and we have a good time anyways. It's not hating. They have a formula. They follow the formula. It works. But yeah, no, I think this area turns out pretty good. And uh, I try to uh, detail as best I can using these beach props here. I keep it pretty simple. I didn't want to hyper fixate on detailing here because this episode is already really long and I'm not a hyper detailer. So we just kind of move on, but I think it turns out pretty good. One thing that was frustrating is I don't know if the mod is broke or not. I couldn't get the uh, umbrellas that you're seeing there to change colors they all turned out blue so i had to go back and paint them a little bit and then they didn't stick it didn't save so that was frustrating but it is what it is i'm moving on and uh what you also saw me build was what i'm calling the uh, pool access points it's those concrete uh, landings that i made uh, i did that using the concrete networks and then some uh, surfaces and i made those because i've seen those in some resorts uh, where they don't let you have they, they don't have uh, access points all around the pool they kind of limit you and they put them like it's just a different texture so they limit you on where you can go and I think this is just my mind how it works is they're limiting you because it's easier to manage and oversee uh, the stupid people that go to resorts because not everyone's highly intelligent like us like not everyone is as smart as me and my subscribers so they, they limit the stupid people to those areas because it's easier to clean and manage and all that kind of stuff. At least that's my theory. Uh, I could be wrong, but I didn't want to line the entire pool because that would have been a lot of move at work and multi-network tool. And I already had things looking pretty good the way I liked it. So I just stuck with it. And now what I'm adding is I've seen this in a few places. Uh, I got this idea when I went to Lake of the Ozarks and I went to one of their... Uh, their lakeside bar areas and they have a pool and they'll have these uh, outcroppings in the middle of the pool that people can stand on, they can dance, they can do whatever they want. People will typically set their drinks up on them. So my thought process, I was going to put these in the middle of the pool and they just add like an, another unique character. 
say like a, you had a really big party going on, you could have girls or guys up there dancing suggestively or however you want to go about it. Uh, I just thought that'd be a fun addition and yeah, I went with it. Uh, not too much more to comment on it about that. Uh, then we move on to the tennis area. Uh, I moved the tennis courts out of the resort because I thought that was kind of weird and I built a tennis club over here. Um, th this was kind of a, a last minute project. I didn't anticipate on building a tennis club on this peninsula at all. I thought it was going to be two resorts. But then I looked at the space I had and I really didn't have enough space to do another resort in my opinion. And this was an awkward little section out there. I'm like, well, what can I put here? And I thought about it. I'm like, well, I'm moving the tennis courts from the one resort. Why don't I just put them here and just make a tennis club and we'll see how it looks. And I think it turned out really good. Uh, I'm really happy with the way it turned out. I think what I enjoyed most about this part of the build here with this tennis club area is how organic it looks. Uh, it's an awkward lot shape, but it filled in really nicely. It doesn't look blocky or uh, cookie cutter. It looks very organic to me. Uh, you can let me know what you think down below, but I like the look of it and the shape of it. But anyways, we're now on the home stretch of the episode, guys. So I just wanted to take a second to let you know I will be out of town all next week again. Uh, so my next upload might be a while, and I'm sorry about that. Work has been sending me all over the place. This week I'm going down to Arkansas for some training, so I won't be back. And then when I'm done with Arkansas, I go up to Chicago for a couple days. So I won't be back until pretty late next week. But when I do return, it's gonna be with the City Skylines 2 build, and hopefully they have that new Road Builder mod that I've been seeing pop up on YouTube. I'm really looking forward to playing with that. That looks awesome. But now for the customary YouTube stuff as we wrap up. Uh, if you liked what you saw or heard, please click the buttons below as it makes me feel good and it makes you a good person. And if you really liked what you saw, check out the link to the buy me a coffee because I love coffee. It's kind of what fuels my soul. But that's all I have, guys. Uh, thanks for watching and you guys have a good day.